Uh, I'm Vaughn Scribner. Uh, first off, thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited for this. It's going to be a real treat. Uh, I've told tonight's author how much I enjoyed his book, and I'm happy and proud to say that I chose this book for this year's book festival, and it absolutely has paid off. Um, before we get into today's uh, lecture, I want to get a couple of little housekeeping things taken care of. Um, it was just one at least. So if you'd like to ask a question during the session, just open up your chat box and type it in there. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on your questions. and I'll try to ask as many of them as I can uh, after Dr. Ponser gives his um, presentation. So um, let's get to the main event. So as I mentioned, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Herman Ponser. He's an associate professor of evolutionary biology at Duke University. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about his excellent book, Burn. Here it is. I, I always take the I always take the sleeves off my books, but the full title, Burn New Research Blows the Lid Off How We Really Burn Calories, Lose Weight, and Stay Healthy. I've been telling all my friends about this book. I've been quoting parts of it to them. Um, and you know, there's I think that a lot of what we talk about today is really going to challenge some of your um, some of your preconceptions about exercise, calories, um, metabolism. I know it did mine. Uh, and yes, as, as Brad here said, you can also purchase uh, Dr. Ponser's book at the website, and then they're available for pickup at Wordsworth Books, which is an excellent bookstore in Little Rock. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, I'll ask Dr. Ponser here to start his presentation. After he gives his presentation, I'll open everything up for questions. I'll start some questions, and, and then we'll, we'll get going from there. So yeah, great. Onward Fantastic. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so excited to be with everybody here. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the, the book to kind of give you a, a sneak peek as to what's in there and what we cover. Uh, so let me go ahead and share a screen to do that. I, uh, oh, you know what? Can someone enable my screen sharing, please? Uh oh, this is... mm -hmm. I think Nathan might have to do that. Yeah, I think Nathan does. I tried. Up, oh, you're you're good okay. now. Okay. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Can you see my my slide? All right. Yep. Fantastic. So uh, I'm excited to talk about yeah my my work uh, over the last ten or so years in uh, human evolution evolutionary anthropology and there is a, a picture of the dust cover if uh, if you want to know what that looks like. Um, so excited to talk about this. I um, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist. And so, you know, you might wonder why somebody like myself would be interested in metabolism. And the truth of the matter is I've actually spent my entire life counting calories. That's what I do. And the reason I do that is because I want to understand how humans evolved. I want to understand how our evolutionary past shapes our bodies today and how that evolutionary legacy sort of affects things like health, well-being, uh, metabolic health, heart disease, obesity and all these real world things. So, you know, if we look about the tree of life and, and every species out there, they're all using energy every day to go about life's essential tasks. Calories are the currency of life. And so if you, like me, are interested in the biology of any species, I'm interested in the biology of humans, but if you're interested in the biology of any species, then you have to know uh, how it spends its calories because life fundamentally from a biological perspective to reduce it down to its, its uh, you know, just, just the, where the rubber hits the road in biology, it's a game of turning energy into offspring. And so I've spent the last 15 or 20 years now measuring energy expenditures and metabolism in humans, as well as non-human primates, some of our closest living relatives. And what I've learned and what I like to share in the book is, is just sort of how fundamental our metabolic evolution has been to our lives. So if we think about the primate branch of the, the, the tree of life, um, one thing we discovered a while ago is that uh, primates are a really slow metabolism group. So humans are primates. So are lemurs and apes like this bonobo and monkeys and all primates, including us, have slow metabolisms. We burn our energy slowly compared to non-primate mammals like deer or carnivores or rodents. And that really slow pace of, of, of metabolism sets us up for a really slow pace of life, right? If, if you have pets or, you know, we think about our dogs 
living in dog years. Every one of every one year of their life is is sort of the equivalent of seven human years, right? We we think about them as as going through life at a faster pace, but it's actually humans and other primates that are the strange ones. We have a really slow pace of life, and that slow pace of life is linked directly to our slow metabolic rate. So the pace of life that we enjoy, these long childhoods, long adult uh, lives, you can live into our 70s, 80s, 90s, even beyond, that slow pace of life that we enjoy is fundamentally about this slow metabolism that all primates have. So metabolism shapes the, the sort of shape of our lives. Uh, if we look within the uh, primates, just, just at our closest living relatives, the apes, we zoom in. Well, if we compare ourselves to the other apes, the story gets a little bit different. So that's the uh, ape family tree there with us in there. And humans, interestingly enough, we have actually increased our metabolic rate a bit, right? So we're still low compared to other mammals, but compared to just our closest relatives, the other apes, we have these fast metabolisms. And that has been fundamental to allow us to evolve these really energy expensive traits like big brains. Um, you know, we evolved as hunter gatherers and that's a really active lifestyle. Um, we give birth to really big babies. Um, some of that longevity that we enjoy is, is because we invest in things like immune system and that kind of thing. So what I want to, you to understand and what I love to talk about in this book and, and it really motivates my research is just how much metabolism has shaped just every aspect of our lives. Um, it's really made us human. So metabolism is at the center of what it makes us human. But of course, that's the evolutionary story. Today, uh, it's a little bit different, isn't it? Today, metabolism is, is increasingly at the center of what makes us sick. So um, cardiometabolic disease, which is to say heart disease, type two diabetes, stroke, some kinds of, of cancers as well, um, are really fundamentally diseases about energy, taking too much energy in, not burning it enough off or not burning it off in the right ways. Um, obesity is, is a clear example of this. Uh, when we gain weight, in fact, the only way we can gain weight is when we eat more calories than we burn off, right? So if we have this mismatch between the calories that we're consuming and the calories we burn off, we're going to have uh, weight gain. And we have increasingly dealt with unhealthy weight gain uh, in this country and, and elsewhere in the world. So here's the U.S. adults, the distribution, right? The bell curve of uh, BMI, body mass index, uh, in 1970 to 1975. And that's here just a little bit later. Oops, is it going to show? There we go, a little bit later. And then a little bit later still, right? And today it's even worse. But as you can see, the, the peak of that bell today is overweight. Right? The most common BMI in the US is an overweight BMI. And a lot of people are, are even uh, have a more unhealthy weight gain than that. And you know, BMI has its, its limitations. Uh, it, it's not the only, it doesn't define us, right? It's, there's, it's just one measure of overall health. Um, but it does predict at the population level, uh, it does predict a lot about our, our health going forward. So people who are at, at higher BMI levels are at a greater risk of developing diabetes, heart disease, and strokes um, at a slightly higher risk of dying from some different cancers. Um, today, you know, today's world, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, having a higher BMI is more likely to, to uh, mean complications with hospitalization, right? So our metabolism is not just fundamental to who we are. Uh, today, increasingly, it's fundamental to how we live our lives and our health. And so how do we get this far off track, right? If, if metabolism is really actually sort of this, this basic human thing that we all share and that makes us so uh, different than other apes, uh, it's been so vital in our evolution. How do we get something so fundamental so wrong? And I spent a lot of the book discussing that. Hope to talk about that more today, but I'll go through a couple of things now. Um, I want to talk about uh, some of the the ways that we sort of misunderstand our metabolism. And I think uh, kind of leads us off track and gets us into trouble. And I wanna draw on, like I do in the book, a lot of the uh, work that I've done over the past 10 or so years with hunting and gathering and other subsistence populations. This man here is a member of the Hadza community in Northern Tanzania. You can see he's holding his bow and arrows there uh, during a hunt. Um, and, you know, uh, again, as an evolutionary anthropologist, I'm interested in our species past and how uh, our past shapes our lives today. Well, 
for the past 2 million years, humans have been hunting and gathering. And so if we want to understand uh, the human body in a sort of natural context, uh, you know, populations that are still hunting and gathering today, they're modern populations, of course, but culturally they've retained some, some key cultural elements that allow us to kind of have a, a window into what past cultures might have been like. And they've actually completely changed the way that we think about metabolism today. And I'll talk about a couple of the ways that they've changed how we understand how our bodies work. So talk about it as, as three metabolic myths. Okay. So first of all, the first myth that got absolutely destroyed for me, and I think uh, in general for when, when the, we started doing this work with uh, the Hadza Hunter Gatherer community, was this idea that exercise boosts your metabolism. Now, this seems so obvious, right? That if we exercise more, we'll burn more calories. And a lot of people have said that, well, that's one of the reasons that we have obesity issues and, and health issues in the industrialized world is that we're not burning enough calories anymore, that we have these sedentary lifestyles and these sedentary lifestyles don't burn as many calories. You don't burn as many calories, then that extra cal those extra calories build up as fat and we get overweight and we get sick. Well, all of that, that, that whole view of human metabolism and health is, is premised on this idea uh, about what hunter-gatherers were doing in our past. How many calories were hunter-gatherers hunter burning? And, you know, it turns out uh, when I started this work about 12 years ago, nobody had ever actually measured how many calories hunter-gatherers burn every day. And so we wanted to go and, and measure that uh, and have a look at um, energy expenditure in a hunting and gathering community. And so to do that, we went to one of the last hunter-gatherer populations on the planet, the Hadza community in Northern Tanzania. And here's a couple of snapshots of, of Hadza life. They're traditional hunter-gatherers. Um, they don't have any domesticated crops or animals or machines or vehicles or guns or electricity or plumbing, right? Instead, every morning they wake up and they go to, to get food from the wild landscape around them. Uh, women typically go out together to gather wild plant foods, right? Sometimes that's gathering berries. Sometimes that's digging up wild tubers with a wooden stick into the rocky ground. Uh, wild root vegetables are a big part of the diet, often with a kid on your back if you're a Hadza mom. Men typically head out um, by themselves. They, they feel like they hunt better uh, if they hunt by the solo. So here's a Hadza man st uh, stalking a zebra, actually, with a bow and arrow that they make. They get about 19,000 steps a day, right? So it's an incredibly physically active lifestyle. If you go out with a Hadza uh, like we do and you spend the day with them, in fact, we spend weeks and sometimes months with them. Um, you'll end up doing a lot of walking. They're always, always walking. If you want to put some numbers on how much they walk every day, they get about 120 or more minutes of exercise a day. Now, they're not really exercising, right? That's just their normal daily life. But they're getting 120 minutes of, of physical activity every day, which is five to 10 times more exercise and activity than you probably got today as a typical American. So we wanted to ask the obvious question, right? How much more energy do the Hadza adults burn compared to people in the Western world, in the industrialized world? And so we measured it using this new technique, a uh, relatively new technique anyway, called the doubly labeled water technique. It's, a, it's an isotope tracking technique. It is the cutting edge gold standard method for measuring energy expenditure in normal daily life. You don't have to have anybody in a laboratory. Instead, you, you drink some water with, that's enriched in these isotopes and uh, we can take urine samples back to the lab and, and calculate how many calories people are burning um, over the course of about seven to 10 days. So it's a really good look at somebody's daily average expenditure. And we expected the Hadza to have really high energy expenditures compared to people in the US and Europe and other industrialized countries, right? Because we thought that metabolism could get boosted with physical activity. What we found really shocked us. And here's a, a plot of one of the papers that, that came out of this. Here's fat-free mass. That's your body size. That's how big you are. In fact, that, that's your lean mass. And this is how many calories a day you're burning. These are logged because for, to do the statistical analysis, you have to log the, the numbers. But look, every dot here is a person. The red dots are Hadza, men and women. The gray dots are men and women from the US and Europe and other industrialized populations. Open dots are women, closed dots are men. And as you can see very clearly, the Hadza have the same energy expenditures. They're in the same cloud of points as men and women in the US and other market economies, right? There's no difference. Even though they get five to 10 times more physical activity every day than you do, 
they don't have any, uh, their, their daily energy expenditure is indistinguishable from yours. So that was a big surprise. And that busted our first myth, this idea that you can increase your metabolic rate. You can boost your metabolism with exercise. Now it's not just the Hadza. We followed this up with other populations. We see this in, uh, in the U S too, in, in inter exercise intervention studies, you get somebody exercising their energy expenditure just doesn't go up the way that it's supposed to. In fact, people can start an exercise program tomorrow. And after about six months or so, after your body's adjusted, you'll be spending the same number of calories every day as you were before you started. Now that helps us bust our second myth, which is this idea that exercise is a great way to lose weight. Well, if exercise is not changing how many calories you burn every day or not, not really, it's not going to be a good way to lose weight because to lose weight, we have to burn more calories than we eat. So if exercise isn't changing how many calories you burn, it's not going to be a great way to lose weight. And actually we've known this for a while. If we look at exercise intervention studies here, this is people who got assigned, they, they signed up for an exercise study and they did somewhere between any, anywhere from three to four to sometimes 16, 18, 24 months of exercise for these studies. The studies vary in how long they are. And we can ask how much weight did you lose, right? Well, it's kind of disappointing. In short studies that are only two or three months long, people tend to lose weight. That's great, but actually the results are all over the map. But in general, you're gonna find lots of people who lose weight after two or three months. But as time goes on, as those exercise studies persist at 12 months, at 18 months and longer, the expected weight loss from exercise alone is only two kilograms, right? So if you lost zero weight, you'd be here on the zero line. And people are approaching that zero line here as the studies get longer and longer, right? Exercise alone is not a great way to lose weight. Two things, if you burn more, you eat more. But secondly, if you exercise more, you actually don't even burn more as much more as you think you do. Here's what happens instead. Imagine these two people, right? Have the same lifestyles. They burn some amount of their energy every day on activity and the rest of their calories on other stuff. This person on the right changes their lifestyle and decides to exercise. And for a while, their total energy expenditure goes up because activity goes up, ex activity expenditure goes up and everything goes up. But then after a few months, their body starts to adjust and brings the other expenditure back down so that their total expenditures at the end of, the, of his exercise program here in a year or so is pretty much similar to where he was before he started. Now, that sounds like a bad thing, but actually that's a really good thing right? And I, I want to be really clear here. Exercise is really, really important. And this adjustment that you probably didn't even know about is one of the reasons it's so important because that less other stuff is less inflammation, less stress reactivity, uh, keeps your reproductive hormones in check. Here's this measure of inflammation, right? We all have heard of inflammation and how bad it is for us. People who exercise a little bit, a few times a month or a lot every month have a lower and lower incidence of, inf of high inflammation. Reproductive hormone levels, if you look at men who uh, like to exercise by running long distances, long distance runners, compared to sedentary people, sedentary men, um, people, men who run more and more and more, right, for one year or for two years or five or 10 or 15 years of, of, of endurance running, their testosterone levels are actually a bit lower. Now, that's, they're not, it's not dysfunctional. It's not a problem. And it's actually a good thing uh, because all that exercise helps prevent reproductive cancers right? Probably by helping to reduce uh, the amount of reproductive hormones that you have circulating in your body. And groups like the Hadza actually have testosterone levels that look like these men who have been exercising for a long time. Here's another good example of the benefits of this metabolic adjustment. If we look at women who were, uh, these are college age women who reported mild depression sy symptoms in the study, they either got talk therapy or talk therapy plus exercise. And in the exercise portion of the study, the amount of epinephrine, that's adrenaline, and cortisol, which is another stress hormone, the amount of epinephrine and cortisol they produced over the course of a day was 30% lower when they were exercising. So what does exercise do? It reduces your stress reactivity. It puts your reproductive hormones in a healthy place. It reduces your levels of inflammation. And those are all adjustments that make, that, that keep your energy expenditure kind of in check, but are actually really healthy for you. So exercise isn't a great way to lose weight, but it's still really important because it does all these amazing things. Last one I'll talk about is this idea that humans evolved to eat a meat heavy paleo diet. Uh, 
you know, if we've talked about the energy that we burn off, let's talk about the energy that we bring in. And we can go to the Hadza here again. Here are Hadza women digging up these uh, starchy tubers that they persist on. A lot of the diet is these tubers. They're working hard for starch here, not so much for meat. Uh, tubers are a big part of the diet. So are berries and baobab fruits. These are all high carb uh, fruits and, and vegetables. Um, they also eat a lot of fiber, by the way, which is important to remember. They do like meat and men hunt every day for meat almost. But even when they do get meat, it's always leaner than you'll find in your supermarket. And it's also hard to find and often can be scarce. Oh, and by the way, when men aren't hunting, they're often climbing these big baobab trees to chop into them to get honey. Honey is about 15 to 20% of the, of the Hadza diet. And honey is just sugar and water, right? Hadza diets are variable across the year, right? A lot of times it's over half the calories are honey. It's always a lot of fruit and vegetables, right? Meat can be a big portion of the diet, but not usually year round. So hunter-gatherer diets are really variable. If we look across populations, we see even more of that variation, right? Here's a bunch of populations of hunter-gatherer diets from equatorial diets, right, at the equator up to near the poles. Yes, in colder climates, you eat more meat. Sure you do, because fewer plants grow there. But in the warm and temperate climates where we all basically are from, uh, there's a huge mix of meat and plants in the diet, right? So the real hunter-gatherer diet, like the Hadza here, looks something like this, a lot of carbohydrate, not much fat, and a fair amount of protein. It doesn't look anything like the so-called paleo diets that we're often told about. So hunter-gatherer diets are diverse. Many are carb heavy. The real problem with the modern foods isn't that they have too many carbs or anything like that. The problem with our modern food environments is that instead of being diverse, they're perverse, right? They have, we have a preponderance of really high to energy dense foods hugely pro overly processed, ultra processed foods and our paleolithic brains don't handle it well, okay? Uh, we see these cheap, easy to digest, yummy calories and we can't help ourselves and we tend to overeat. And ultra processed foods we know from lab studies push people to overeat and to gain weight and they're becoming a bigger and bigger part of the diet. So here from the 1930s up till today, you can see the increase in ultra processed foods in the Canadian diet the US and the UK are right there too. This is a growing problem in the developing world too. So this is our, our metabolisms and the way that we get our food and, and source our food. It isn't just a US issue or a developed world issue. It's increasingly a global issue. So just to wrap up, your metabolism is an amazing, dynamic, uh, critically important part of your evolution. To watch your weight, you want to focus on your diet. For everything else, you wanna focus on exercise and be active throughout the day. So diet and exercise are two different tools for two different jobs. And that's just a, a kind of quick overview of some of the things I'm excited about and, and was able to share in the book. Um, looking forward to talking with Vaughn more about it here and hearing your questions as well. If you wanna know more about the Hadza, you can go to hadzafun.org and check us out there. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter, that's my handle. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Herman. I really enjoyed that. And I thought that was a great, um, you know, core expression of your book. Now, I wanted to bring, like, I want to start off with a couple of questions of my own, and then we'll branch out from there into the audience. Um, I guess just uh, a, a selfish question on this, because uh, when I, I was in my office, I love working out. I love doing elliptical. I love weightlifting, running. And I've always had this idea that like, well, of course, you know, if I work out, I'm going to burn these excess calories. And then, oh, I can have 3,500 calories today instead of 3,000. And I also always operate on this assumption that if I ran a mile harder and faster, <laughs> then I'd burn more calories. And when yeah. I read that, that, you know, so for all of you, there's this part where Herman explains that when you run a mile, like each person, so if I run a mile in six minutes or if I run a mile in 10 minutes, I'm going to burn the same amount of calories. It's all about distance. Now, if I run, you know, a six minute mile and I run 30 minutes, I'm going to run farther during that time. So I'm going to burn more calories. The same doesn't go for walking, swimming. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, and so the faster you walk or swim, you can burn more calories. Okay. Yeah. So having said all that, and I, it makes sense that when you first start exercising, you're going to burn more calories at first because you're kind of throwing your body off. Does it change if you 
So if you change up your types of exercise, mm. is that true that you kind of like trick your body or, or not? I guess your heart rate, your heartbeat doesn't know the difference between you running or you lifting weights. I imagine yeah. elevated heart rate. So yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. And the short answer is we really don't know yet. So um, this phenomenon of energy adjustment where your body adjusts your lifestyle and after a while kind of gets used to it and goes, okay, well, we're going to change some things around so that when mm -hmm. I'm exercising three days a week, that my total sort of weekly budget doesn't get pushed up where, you know, it doesn't get elevated. It comes back down to baseline. Cause that's, you know, that's the time frame to think about for this energy compensation, right? Is your body's trying to keep sort of week long week, you know, that that's the time rise week long expenditures in the same, you're going to have days that are big and days that are small, but mm -hmm. week issue, right? So your body's trying to adjust that. Can you, can you mess with that? Right. I love the idea. Can you mess with that yeah. by lifting weights for a month and then running distance for a month or, mm -hmm. or hit or something like that? Um, we don't know because we've only really understood, begun to understand this phenomenon so recently. I mean, it is really pretty new yeah. that we don't have a great handle on, on all the ways that we might be able to trick our, our ways out of it. Um, I'm okay. going to make a prediction that says it doesn't matter uh, because I, I think like you say, you know, your heart doesn't know, um, your heart doesn't know what you're doing. You're just, just bumping out blood and, and trying to match demand. Um, yeah. But until we figure out exactly what the signaling mechanisms are, and there's a bunch of possibilities out there, we just have to narrow them down. But until we know those, it's not going to be clear uh, how that works. Yeah. Okay, great. And then um, a follow-up to that is I love, so one of the parts beyond all the interesting points, the various points that you've talked about in these revelations, I love that you, and going back to your, sorry, evolutionary anthropology, not biology, I don't know why. Oh, that's okay. That's okay, yeah. Um, my, my mistake there. Um, but I love that you talk about, what makes humans and what gave us the edge is that we share. And could yeah. you uh, exp expand upon that a little yeah. bit for the audience? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I talked about how humans have evolved compared to the, our closest relatives like chimps and, and bonobos and gorillas. We have this faster metabolism than them. Um, and how do you evolve that? Well, a species can't evolve a faster metabolic rate unless it's able to, to sort of dependably get more calories in. Right. I mean, no, no species can run a, a deficit, right? You can't, mm -hmm. you can't go broke too much or else you just don't make it. Um, so how, do, how was it that we were able to sort of squeeze more calories out of the landscape somehow? Um, mm -hmm. And the answer is when we went to hunting and gathering, right? All of a sudden we're playing two games simultaneously. We're doing the gathering thing that apes all do, humans do. Mm -hmm. And now we add this hunting thing. Now hunting's tough because you often come home empty handed right? You often don't, but, but when it pays off, it pays off really big. The only way that you can make that work, right? And have hunters that don't starve to death is that everybody at the end of the day shares. Yes. Right. So people talk about, oh, hunting and gathering. It's all about the hunting or it's all about the gathering. It's the and, right? It's the and that makes it work. It's the sharing that makes it work. And now we take it for granted that we share. So every time you have a big event in your life, it's a birthday party or barbecue or whatever, you share food. You take that for mm -hmm. granted, but other animals don't share food like that, right? No way. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's a, it has changed our, our mindsets, it's changed our social worlds, and it's changed our metabolism. Yeah, and just even to build on that, I love that you then talk about, like, so in my own research time, or 18th century enlightenment stuff, it was always a, this idea that humans are social, sociable beings by yeah. our nature. And so you get back to the core of this, but I also really like that you mentioned two downsides that come out from that sharing. Mm -hmm. Could you expand upon that a little bit too? Those yeah. Downsides? Well, the, the big downside is that, um, you know, if I'm going to share with my group, right. I don't want to, I don't want to get fooled into sharing with people who aren't going to share back, right. There have to be, there have to be kind of constraints on that sharing because if I share with someone who knew is never going to share with me back down the road, that's a bad, that's a bad deal. That's a bad bet. Mm -hmm. Right. And so humans as this hyper social uh, species, we're very, we'll share with anybody who's part of our group, but man, if I think that you're not in my group, you're right. And those are culturally defined groups. That's where it kind of gets really fluid and, and tricky, right? Yes. If we define somebody else's other, and of course, we all know how we do that in a very pol politicized, you know, polarized world we live in. We understand if we define somebody else's other, we almost don't owe them the same kind of human, right? Behavior that we, we owe our group. And I think that that's, it's made in group sociability. It's ramped that up, but it also, I think is a danger of, of being sort of xenophobic or, yes. you know, to, to be too anti other, 
We have to watch that mm-hmm. about ourselves. That's a, that's an, a tendency that we all have. We're just born with that. Totally. Yeah. And I really like that. And I was able to, and you know, we see that ramping up. And I also like you talking, you got to it in your intro talk, these, these diseases of civilization oh, we yeah. have now where, and I, you know, this really hit home with me. You mentioned one point in the book where like, and I'm going to get to one of the questions here that I think is going to answer this even more, get to this even more, but like, it's easier to push away from the table when you're eating half raw zebra yeah. meat from five days ago. Cause you're like, okay, this isn't the tastiest thing I've ever eaten, but it's nourishing yeah. me. I'm full. But when we live, you know, when I get a portion of pad thai that's enough for four people and I can't yeah. stop eating it and just slam the whole thing, it's, we, we were, and we have so much access to it now. It's so easy for us. Yeah. So that yeah. goes back to your. No, that's exactly point. right. You know, um, you know, we have these big brains, all this technology, and we have done exactly what you would expect any animal to, to do, right? Mm-hmm. If we let <laughs> if we let the animals run the zoos, what would they look like, right? They would be, yeah. it'd be all candy and sofas. And, totally. uh, and that's what we built for ourselves. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we also tend to put on fat. We actually put on fat more easily than other apes do. Mm-hmm. Um, other apes don't put on as much fat as we do, surprisingly. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a... We, we we really engineered ourselves into this mess, right? With a lot of other good things. I mean, look, yes. we also have sanitation and antibiotics mm-hmm. and vaccinations and, and electricity and all these great things. So we've yes. done a pretty good job, but uh, totally. we needed to handle the other part, the downsides and, and kind of open our eyes to that. Yeah, you talk about the part of our brain that's like that pleasure portion that gets <laughs> shot off when you eat food like that. And you're just like, oh my, you know, so yeah, it's something I think we all can connect with there. I'm going to go to Toby Pledger as a great question. Um, Do you recommend a diet, Mediterranean or other, that works well for weight loss and is healthier and more natural for us than the low carb keto diet? And I I know the answer to this, I think, but. Yeah, well, uh, what I'm going to say is there's a wide variety of diets that can work for people. Um, If you you, basically, if you want to find a diet that works for you, it's a diet that keeps you feeling full on fewer calories. And for some people that low carb thing works great for them. And I'm not here to tell anybody to change their diet if they're on a diet that works for them. Um, I don't think that low carb diets are a good are a good reflection of what humans used to eat, but that's beside the point, right? Um, if it's a, any diet works, if you can stick to it. So the question is what mm-hmm. diet can you stick to? And for some yes. people that's gonna be vegan plant-based, some people that's gonna be you know meat-based keto mm-hmm. carnivore, um, a lot of people do well on Mediterranean and, you know, I, I think of course you want to avoid the junk food. You want to avoid ultra processed foods. Um, so whole food, if you can do it, but exactly what's on your plate, um, a lot of things can work. It's, it's whatever works for you that keeps you at a healthy weight. Yeah. This is something I reflect on a lot. I'll be, you know, like we both live in this world, Herman, you and I have eternal 18 to 23 year olds. And as I'm getting older, I'm going to the gym every day these days and i see my students slamming a candy bar and a grill and a fried chicken sandwich and then they walk in the gym and they have a six-pack abs and i'm like what is going on how does this work yeah. i ate three hard-boiled eggs and a piece of cheese for lunch like what's good anyway um it's that uh, it's just so interesting how this works and yeah. just building off that carolyn wiggin asked do you look at the idea of eating between 7 a.m to 3 p.m i'm not re- remembering the word for that type it's intermittent fasting yeah sorry yes. yeah so how do you feel about intermittent fasting Uh, really when it comes right down to it, that's just another way to cut calories. So there's actually been some really good, uh, uh, randomized controlled studies, randomized controlled trial studies in in the last few months, actually, uh, that, you know, you're randomized, you sign up for the study. You don't know if you're going to get the intermittent fasting group or the just lower your calories group. You don't know going into it, you get randomly assigned and we see how you do. We check in with you in three months and see how you did. If you just cut calories just by smaller portions, or if you cut calories by intermittent fasting, um, both groups end up in the same place. And that's in terms of all of their health markers, their body weight, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So intermittent fasting is one of these ways that people really like, it really works for them. And it's, it's, if that works for you, that's great. Um, I don't think there's any real magic to it, but that doesn't mean everything feels like magic. If you're at a healthy weight and aren't even, and, and feel like it's, you know, it's easy. That always feels like magic, um, but but inside your body, there's you know physiologically, there's no magic there. Yeah, I also I I toyed with the keto diet and intermittent fasting, 
a, a while ago and I lost weight. Um, sure. So my old COVID, my old COVID 15. And, um, but it really, I realized it just came down to like, yeah, if I don't eat between nine and five, sometimes I do like a full one day a week, I do that. Yep. You can, you can only theoretically, if you eat a healthy meal for dinner, a generally healthy meal, you can still feel full and you're not going to go over your BMR. Exactly. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, two people, these are kind of related questions. One, does weight training or anything increase metabolism? And then this, the, um, the, I love to exercise, but the more I do it, the hungrier I get. So what should I eat to satiate me, but still fuel my workout? So at, one, does weight training increase metabolism? Two, what can someone eat that's healthy, but still helps fuel their workout? So they're kind of- Good question. So weight training tends to build muscle. So, mm -hmm. okay. So if you're bigger, like, you know, you've got 37 trillion cells. Every one of your cells is like a microscopic factory and it's chugging along. And so if you have more of those cells, if you're bigger, right, you're going to burn more calories just because you're bigger. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you are resistance training, building muscle, you'll burn more calories just by virtue of being bigger. Um, that won't necessarily make you lose fat. Uh, you might, mm -hmm. but not necessarily. Um, and, you know, because like you're the second question is, well, when you work out, guess what? You get hungry right? Your body's really good at matching how much you burn to how much you eat. So how do you kind of get around feeling like you're starving all the time or feeling like you're eating so much that you're kind of overeating what you exercised before, you know? Um, okay. There's a couple really good principles out there, uh, that have been well-established for making people feel full on fewer calories. Um, this comes out of work from a bunch of different labs, not my own, but this is, this is really well-established stuff. Um, protein, High protein foods, going to help you feel full. Um, high fiber foods, help you feel full. Uh, foods with lots of processed sugars and oils and like baked goods, you're going to feel hungry, right? So, I mean, it kind of is that simple, um, but, but exactly what that looks like for you is going to depend on what you like to eat and, and what makes you feel. You know, test, feel free to test and experiment. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Um, I've got, I'm going to get to the back of the chat here. I just have one more in the Q&A and then all of those people you, who've done the chat will get back to that. Uh, this is from an anonymous person. Um, As a menopausal woman, I'm dismayed by my lack of energy and seemingly slow metabolism. Mm. What role do hormones play in regulating our metabolism? How should we alter our diet to account for that? Yeah. So interestingly, we don't see a decrease in energy expenditure at menopause. But, and this gets to a really critical thing, how much energy you feel like you have is not really, that, that's, a, that's a kind of a, a mental psych psychological thing. We all feel, we all wake up in the morning feeling like, oh, are we running, our, running on empty? Are we running full blast, right? And that has a lot of, that hormones are a big part of that. How much good sleep you've got is a part of that. Stress is a part of that. And so that's a different thing. We call that energy. That's not the same as your metabolism, actually. So your metabolism doesn't really slow down around menopause, but if you're feeling like your, you know, energy, you know, how much energy you feel, your vitality is changing, your sleep habits are changing, that can lead to changes in the way you eat, that can lead to changes in the way you sleep, and that could end up having, for example, effects on your weight or knock-on effects on how good you feel. Um, and so it's a really, I'm not a, a menopause specialist, so I don't want to give advice that I, I can't back up. Um, but you know, this is something to talk to a doctor about. Uh, you might th talk, think about like hormone replacement therapy. There are different things out there for people going through menopause uh, and, and that can have effects on, on how they feel. So good luck. I, I wish I had yeah. even more to say. Well, I really liked, it was crazy to me that you said that in your book, some people do actually have fast and slow metabolisms. Yeah. That's a thing. And I, I always thought that was kind of a a myth and that people just want to like, want to say like, well, I just have a slow metabolism. Be like, yeah. yeah, sure you don't, but it's a, it's a real thing. So. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. Yeah. All right. I, this is an interesting question. I'm curious of the impact this type of research has on the Hazda people, mm. Hazda people, since they are one of the few remaining hunter gatherer societies, are they receiving too much exposure to the outside world because of researchers? That's a great question. And something that we really work hard and work with their community mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we're doing this a way that they're comfortable with and they're happy about. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons we set up the Hadza Fund. And please, if you are interested in learning more, if you want to help them out, you can go to the HadzaFund.org. It's a charity we started to help to try to give back. Um, we are uh, 
you know, really aware of our responsibilities when we work with a group like the Hadza. Uh, so we go, first of all, we get all the, you know, all the permits from the government, research permits, we get uh, ethical approvals from everybody. We, and, and then most importantly, we talk with the Hadza community and we ask them if, if they're okay with us when we go out and, and live with them and, and do this work and we have that conversation, it's a two-way street. And we compensate, if, for example, we compensate them the same that if, um, if somebody comes to my laboratory here at Duke and participates in a study, or you participate in a study for any laboratory, then you should be compensated for your time. That's a, a general mm -hmm. rule of doing good research. And, and we always compensate them with things like, you know, with, with the equivalent of what we would pay somebody here in the States, for example. Mm -hmm. So we try to be really careful about it and thoughtful about it. We try to involve them in these decisions about how we do this work. One thing to understand is that they aren't, they're not really isolated or sort of naive to the world. They live in a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a wide open part of East, of, of East Africa, but there have been different groups, including, you know, in the last few hundred years, um, Europeans and other expats kind of moving through that part of, of Tanzania for generations now. And so they know about the outside world. It, it's sort of, it's equivalent to sort of the, like the Amish or mm -hmm. Mennonite, uh, you know, traditional Mennonite orders here in the States who they, they know about the outside world. Um, they know about, you know, city living and electricity and cars, and, and some of them adopt that stuff, but a lot of them don't. They just don't want to. They want to keep their old culture. And the Hads are, are more like that, right? So they're not, we, it's, a, it's, you're right to be that, that we are very careful and, and concerned about that. And we think we're doing it as uh, the best way we can. Yeah, that's great. It's a good answer. I like, and I remember in the book, what's the movie they like to watch? <laughs> yeah, they love to watch nature doc documentaries. Um, okay. They love it. And they also, um, I think the biggest response we ever got was uh, Jurassic Park. That's it. Jurassic. I mean, they love I, I would. Yeah. I, I love too that you mentioned this idea that I'm, I'm very guilty of this. We, you know, like animals, we if killing an animal or something. We get mm. very, we really get attached to it, but they don't see it that way because it's just yeah. a cultural thing. They're like, well, it would kill me or I need it for me. It's not, yeah. So I thought that was an interesting part of the book as well. I really like that. Yeah. And like you said, they're not like an uncontacted tribe in the Amazon. They're a group of people. I like that you make that Amish example. They know the world. They, they can, they would ask you questions oftentimes oh, yeah. about certain things. They come, I remember how, how far to get to your house, like how far of a walk would it be? And yeah, you're like, how, well, how long would it take for me to walk to your house? Yeah. Is and it, you're like, is well, yeah, it is a great question because and that, that's the way they think in distances because they don't jump in a car and drive around. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I think Herman does a really good job through his book. He starts each chapter with kind of an anecdote, one in which he's had too much wine the night before. Um, <laughs> yeah, that sounds brutal in the middle of the, yeah, yeah that was. Um, all right, so another Paul. Uh, Spencer asked, as one of my students, hi, Paul, is there any data on changes in metabolism of the Mediterranean population once the agricultural revolution sedentary society took hold? Was there any change with the domestication of animals? So like, you know, there's this Mediterranean diet. Is there any, did it, how has this all affected them? Uh, so I have two answers to that question. One is that if we look at people who live in the Mediterranean today, they have the same metabolism as everybody else. We don't see, they don't stand out. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, we can't go back in time and watch them transition into early agriculture and then through to living in cities and states. But as it happens, uh, one of the groups that I've also had a chance to work with a bit, this is actually work led by Sam Erlocker, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time and now is a Baylor, a professor at Baylor. He went to work with the Shuar community. Now, the Shuar community, um, they live in the rainforest in the Amazon and they do a lot of hunting and gathering too. But they're a much bigger community. It's about 20,000 or so people in the Shuar uh, culture. And some live in towns, like sort of small cities mm -hmm. and towns. And so Sam measured, he was, he was focusing on children. He measured children in very rural hunting and gathering villages. And he also measured children, same age and everything in, um, you know, in, in more of, he called them the urban uh, group, but they weren't really urban by American standards. They're very, very early in the transition into sort of, you know, development, um, but uh, moving away from farming more towards market integration, their metabolism was the same no matter what. 
both groups had the same daily expenditure, just like we see with the Hadza, same as everybody, same everywhere. Um, but the kids that grew up in these towns and small cities, they do have more body fat, right? And so their body composition is changing. They're putting on more fat, not unhealthy, but, but more. Uh, and it's because of the energy coming in, right? Because the energy going out is the same. So if we were to go back and, and get a snapshot of these Mediterranean groups going through, we, I, I suspect we'd see the same thing that they have the same expenditure throughout. And what's changing is the energy that's coming in. Interesting. All right, yeah. And uh, I, just building off that, have you ever measured, have you ever done the water to measure your own BMR? You know, I've done everything in my lab except for that. And it's because it's expensive. And okay. uh, I have to be a very careful budgeter when I'm running you know, these federal, federal mm -hmm. grants to do this kind of work. Um, it's about, mm, it's close to a thousand dollars, well, 500 to a thousand dollars to measure your energy expenditure with doubly labeled water. Um, wow. I will say that it's not because I'm afraid to do it or anything like that. It's totally uh -huh. safe. And it's yeah, easy, yeah. In, in Western medical you know, nutrition studies all the time. It's, it's, uh, it's, com it's a completely safe technique. I just haven't been yeah. able to do it yet for myself. Cause you provide that graph. On, I can't remember on the page. And I, I tried to do mine and I think I'm something like probably doesn't right. Something like 3000. Yeah, I like bet that's right for you. Cause yeah. I'm like 175 pounds. So yeah. yeah, I thought, but that's just a really useful tool for all of you when you buy this book, the, the crazy, the, one of the best things for this book for me is it, it just really helped me understand how my body works. I realized how much I've been running on just n false, false notions for the longest time. Um, and it, that's, that's one of the things that really has leapt out about this for me. Um, another quote that from your book that I really like that maybe you could build on is, and I had this one bolded in with highlight. <laughs> Thinking is incredibly cheap, but learning is quite energetically expensive. I thought that, explain that a little bit more. To yeah, the, isn't that amazing to think about? Yeah. Uh, so right now you and I, right, we're not doing as much learning as we were when we were five, mm -hmm. right? when we were five years old and the world was new and you are just drinking from the fire hose and learning everything about human culture and the natural world and everything, your brain is constantly, it's just, it's just, you know, on fire and it's building little connections between neurons, pulling unused ones apart and all of that physical work. Cause that's what learning is, is are these physical, it's like plugging in and unplugging, you know, an electrical mm -hmm. cord into a socket, all of that work, you burn so much energy and actually little kids, I've got a seven-year-old daughter. So she's just on the, on the other side of the, of the, the peak from this, but she's still up there. The kids in that early elementary school age, their brains burn so many calories that it actually slows down how fast they can grow. God, that's crazy. Isn't that incredible? That's um, insane. And now when you and I, as adults, we're not doing as much of that anymore. And mm -hmm. our brains are still expensive, but not nothing like that. It's yeah. And it, it even like, I, I told my students this recently, like, Hey guys, learning burns more calories. Like FYI, come on. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, and this kind of going back to this idea of research and discovery, I guarantee that I know that this Hadza research moment for you was huge. In the oh. book, you note that it, you know, you thought it would get some attention, but it got, it blew up. Uh, one of my best friends owns a gym. He's a, in Chicago, he's a double major physical therapy and all anyway he he was talking when i mentioned the hot thing he was like oh yeah yeah i know we use that in the in the weight field all weightlifting you know and and wow. but i wanted to call him to talk about your book because do you use that great anecdote where you talk to someone who studies exercise and they're like because you know you think a lot of these people who like run gyms and stuff is like shut up herman stop saying this <laughs> don't say you know, and there is plenty of good reasons to work out. Just losing weight necessarily isn't one of them. But you yeah. you mentioned that that the guys like the problem in America today is a lot of part of the world people work out for vanity. They don't. It's not enough to know that they're not going to have a heart attack probably working out. And so, have you experienced much pushback from yeah. people in the you know exercise science field or people who are running gyms or I'm sure 24 what is it 24 fitness or whatever? Yeah, they're not inviting you to come. <laughs> there. Yeah, chill. I'm still waiting for that invitation. Maybe that'll yeah. happen. Uh, oh, the Fitbit people too. I don't know if they're gonna. Oh, I'm, up, I'm on their list. Um, you know, it's been funny. There's been two, I guess, sort of two kind of groups of feed kinds of feedback. One is from you know researchers in, in my field who 
you know, say, well, wait a second, that you're making some really big claims here. Let's start to unpack the mechanism. Exactly. How is this working? And those are great discussions to have because I'm curious too. And so yeah. by kind of working it out, we're going to, we're going to continue to move the ball down the, the field. That's how science works with these kind of scientific, well, how exactly does this work then kind of debates. Mm -hmm. And then there's the debate of, I just don't believe it. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I started exercising and I lost so many pounds and, and, and I always think I'm so happy for you that you had gr this great success, but you, people don't usually have that kind of success. You know, the, the, the overall phenomenon here is not that. Um, mm -hmm. And so you just, some people, I think you're just never going to change their minds or, yeah. or they're worried, you know, I guess the cynical view is they're worried about what happens to the bottom line, you know, for their gyms or whatever, oh. if they, uh, I, but I haven't had too much totally. of that, but I think there are so many good reasons to exercise that I think we just yes. have to sell. Yeah. Here's, here's what I worry about. We tell people to exercise for weight loss. They sign up January 1st. They start going to the gym. They might lose weight in January and then they, they stop losing weight mm -hmm. and they go out oh, the heck with this. It's not working or I'm not doing it right. Or I don't have enough time to invest apparently because I guess I need to go even more or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you sell something that's never going to happen for the large majority of people, they're going to get disappointed and they're going to stop exercising. And that's the worst thing that could happen, yes. right? You want them to keep exercising. We all want to be healthier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm sympathetic to the idea that humans are motivated by vanity. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you got to sell what, what is really there and not. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'll be candid. I'm guilty of doing too much cardio. I work out mm. too much. So my friend who he's friends with Jimmy's like, Vaughn, you're just burning yourself out. And there's something this book's really helped me is realize mm. like, okay, you know, I get stuff in my head. Like I've got to work out today. I've got to get my 40 minutes of cardio. And it's like, you've shown that no, you don't, you're, you're going to stay on a baseline. And as you, you mentioned that exercise is it going to help you lose weight next necessarily? But there's, you say that it helps maintain. Oh, that's an interesting let's, wrinkle let's, in all this. Yes. It's not great for losing weight. Um, and it doesn't seem to protect people from sort of becoming obese and sort of like people who are more active than necessarily protected against being, becoming obese or overweight. But this interesting wrinkle here, if you do manage to lose weight, usually through diet, mm -hmm. uh, keeping it off is much easier if you exercise. So that is one place for exercise mm -hmm. is critical in weight maintenance. And it's for those people who are able to lose the weight, but typically you lose weight, you lose the weight through diet and you keep it off with exercise. That's true. That's, that's an yeah. important point. I'm glad. Why do you think that, that is? Does it, does, does uh, continuing to exercise mess with your BMR? Does it? it yeah, it, it might be that it might be that it kind of keeps you somehow your body's able to get back closer to where it was in terms of calories throughput because you're exercising mm -hmm. so much. That's possible. Um, the thing is exercise does so much. When you exercise, literally hundreds of signaling molecules are released from your muscles and into your bloodstream, and it has effects everywhere in your body, including in your brain. And it seems to keep people from overeating. Just, just the signal, the exercise signal seems to be help that, that sort of matching, right? Because your brain's always trying to match imperfectly, yeah. but actually pretty darn close to perfectly, intake to expenditure. And it helps you get even better if you're exercising. Yeah, exactly how there's... that's happening. We we're still working on that. Yeah, well, and that's the thing I love about this book is you you don't say you have all the answers in this. This is uh, you you bring up a lot of really interesting points, and I think very valid points. I think there's something to it. The exercise, if you're still exercising, maybe it makes you stay accountable a little bit more. It keeps you yeah. kind of in the in the game, if you will, where you're like, look, I exercise today. I'm trying to be good. Um, you know, and yeah, I don't know. Um, I know that the so I know that the. Uh, Hodza piece, I always say that it's Hodza. Yes, mm -hmm. Hodza piece was like one of your big aha breakthrough moments. What yeah. was another really big or interesting, like I call them these aha moments in my oh, research yeah. where you're like, oh my God, what's something else that really leapt out at you? Um, I, I have to say it's been, I've been lucky to have a few um, or maybe I'm just overly surprised by, <laughs> by yeah. you discovered by new things. Um, one other fun one was um, how far can you push the human body? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. so one, one thing that, uh, one bit of pushback I got, and this is good pushback I would get is, well, Hey, wait a second. You're telling me that your body's trying to, to limit how many calories you burn. What about Michael Phelps? Right. What's up with that guy? Mm -hmm. He's burning 10,000 calories a day. You're telling me he's, you know, what, how does that fit into your, your, your model? Mm 
Um, and so I, I hadn't given it a whole lot of thought. I didn't think I'd ever be able to sort of really approach that because you can't just go and measure Michael Phelps's energy expenditure. He, he doesn't want to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we had a chance to measure energy expenditure in people who ran, he, they ran a marathon a day from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., right? Five months. They took, a couple, they took a few days off, but they basically ran a marathon a day from That's from disgusting. LA. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so their energy expenditures were quite high. Uh, and we measured them at the beginning and at the end. And, uh, and then we had these data. So, they're, so it, it is just like you might expect. Your body can't compensate for that. Your body, the, the, there's mm-hmm. limits to what your body can do. And if you're running a marathon a day, yeah, okay. Then your expenditure is going to be high mm-hmm. compared to everybody else. You're not going to look like the Hods are like us. Or like, you're, going to look, you're going to be high expenditure. The question is, how long can you maintain that for? And so I went and looked at all the data I could find on things like the Tour de France or mm-hmm. ultra marathon runners or uh, Kona triathletes um, or pregnancy, which is another high energy a, yes. you know, event. Um, and it turns out that if you plot how many calories people are able to burn, highest calorie burns ever measured versus how long they can do it for. Right? Mm-hmm. So the Tour de France is about a month long. These people ran from LA to DC over five months. Pregnancy is nine months long. An Iron Man is a half a day long, if you're good. Um, there's a really clear sort of boundary. You can kind of map the boundary of human ability. And as you go longer and longer, months and months, that boundary comes down, that sort of a metabolic ceiling comes down and it kind of squishes below it. You know, you can't live above the ceiling. The mm-hmm. limits of human, human expenditure are below that ceiling. And it helps explain why groups like, even like the Hod to get squished right into the same daily expenditures as you and me, because that's where that mm-hmm. ceiling ends up sitting. It's just, just over our heads. We don't realize how close we are to it actually day to day. And so that was, it was like, you know, sailing East and ended up West, you know, like, Oh yeah. my gosh, we got to the same phenomenon a different way. And, and that was kind of mind blowing for me. And it's been fun to yeah. think about too, with like the Olympics and all these ultra marathon I love to keep track of that stuff. Um, that, you know, it's been really a fun v- uh, lens on that. Yeah, and, and that's a. I, I thought that was a great part, and I also excuse my language here, but if if nothing else needs to show how badass women can be, as oh my gosh, how much energy expenditure pregnancy takes. Like they're running at like ninety percent or something. Oh, I can't oh, remember yeah. the exact. I I heard something about it on the BBC or NPR. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you, at one it, point. The, a typical pregnancy is 70,000 kilocalories, okay? Not in one day, of course, but over the nine yeah. months, 70,000 kilocalories. Um, it's pushing your the, the metabolic machinery to the same limits, the same red line limits as a Tour de France, but for nine months. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely crazy. Yeah. yeah, and I guess we have to, so, and just a, a kilocalorie is the same as a calorie, correct? Yeah, so sorry. So yeah. I, I like to be- uh, That's the correct I'm, I'm way. We just shortened it in America, yeah. We, when you look at a food label and it says calories, or we talk about a 2000 calorie diet, we actually mean 2000 kilocalories. And that kilo means thousands of, mm-hmm. so it's like, it's weird to me that we don't say kilocalories. Like we don't say grams. When we mean kilograms. Yeah. Right? We don't it's say weird. feet when we mean miles. Like it's just use the right word anyway. Yeah. When I go to the UK for I have a moth in my room, because uh, when I go to the UK, they, I think they have kilocalories there. Kilocalories. They there. might do kilojoules as well. Kilojoules. On, yeah. That's it. Kill, yeah. And so that always confuses me. I'm like, what am I eating? Um, yeah. All right. Well, we are going to have to wrap up here. Um, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. Uh, I, I told Herman that this is the, I enjoyed this nonfiction book more than any one I've enjoyed in a long time. That wasn't a history something. So yeah, I've been recommending to all my friends. I cannot stress enough, guys. There's there's so much more in this book than we talked about today. Don't even think that you're like, well, I just watch this out. No, there's a lot more in there. Um, and honestly, it's a tool. It's been a it's it's gonna be I'm gonna revisit. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Herman, so much uh, for attending, and thank you everyone for your excellent questions. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna go to the this what's the website again? Hadza Hadza Fund. Hodsafund.org. Okay, so I'm going to go to that. Uh, I guarantee after reading the book, you all will want to help out the Hodza people too. They're an incredible group. So thank you so much. And I am going to be logging off. Thanks, everybody. All right.